can go ahead and keep your Bibles open to John chapter 14 this morning. I know the last couple weeks we've been all over Scripture, but today we'll be back to normal. Plan it there in John chapter 14, verses 15 through 31. So you can go ahead again and keep that open. As we begin our study of God's Word this morning, I have a question for you, and it's specifically for you. It's for you if you are a believer, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And the question is this, Christian, do you realize the gift that you have? The gift that you have full possession to, the gift that you have full access to. Now this may be hurtful to hear, but I'm sorry to say it is true of Christians and maybe even some of us at different times in our lives. I know it's true of me. Sometimes Christians can be some of the most sullen, Eeyore-like, depressing people in the world. Sometimes we can get, I can get tired of being around Christians and hearing their conversations because oftentimes our conversations as Christians go something like this. Boy, I don't know, Thelma, things have never been this bad. Things sure are getting worse. It won't be long until Jesus returns now. That's all that we have to look forward to. More specifically in our church, we just don't have a way to reach our community anymore. People just don't go to church. This place used to be full. Do you remember that time 20 years ago when it was full? Oh, but, but that was a long time ago. We will never see that again. We often say things somewhere along the lines of things are as never as good as they used to be. If only, so many times we say, if only Jesus would just come back and make everything better. Sometimes I'm, um, I'm sorry to say, and I'm guilty of this myself, we Christians can be some of the most depressing, depressing, sullen, and seemingly hopeless individuals known to mankind. This fact is illustrated for us in our passage of study this morning. Christians, we can be those with our tails between our legs, beaten down when we should be raised up. And to that, Jesus says to us this question. He says, do you, Christian believers, do you realize the gift that I have given to you? So here's the context for the moment that we find these 12 sullen and sulking Eeyore-like Christians in John chapter 14. It is in the midst of Jesus' famous last night with his disciples in that upper room before Jesus is going to be lifted up on the cross. The evening begins with Jesus sort of killing the vibe, making it a weird vibe of for this party, he begins by washing the disciples' feet. And then he makes it even worse. He predicts that one of his honored guests is about to betray him. That will strike the vibe of any party pretty quick. And it did. And, and so Jesus is here with this group of sullen men trying to comfort them. And in the midst of his actions and, and what should be comfort to the disciples, he actually says something that makes the disciples' grief worse. What does Jesus say? He says that he's going to leave them. And that should be a, a reason for rejoicing, but instead it's a reason for even deeper grief. Jesus says that in a moment they are no longer going to see him. That prediction of Jesus of going away makes it worse for the disciples. And Jesus says to them in their even deeper grief, do you know the gift that I am giving you in my going away? Do you know the gift that I am giving and laying at your feet? Obviously, the disciples don't, and I'm afraid at times and in many ways and circumstances in our lives, we don't know the gift. We don't even scratch the surface in understanding the gift that we have been given in God and through Jesus' going away. The gift, as you have probably already guessed, that is the Holy Spirit. So here, Jesus gives us 16 verses to help us understand this gift that is the Holy Spirit. He's a multifaceted gift, and so there's much to see even in just 16 verses. The first thing I would say, and the, maybe the foremost thing that we need to see, that Jesus wants us to know about the gift of the Holy Spirit, is that he is our advocate. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. If you do this, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Now that word that the NIV here translates as advocate and it is used here by Jesus in the upper room dialogue by Jesus all at all times when referring to the Holy Spirit is paracleti in the original language. Other translations go with helper, some counselor, some go straight to what I think is probably the most literal translation of this word used only here in the New Testament which is one that comes alongside. So here in this moment what is the root of all the disciples grief? 
Why are they upset? Why are they distraught with Jesus? Because he's leaving them, right? They're thinking that Jesus is going to stay with them. They are hoping that Jesus is going to continue to come alongside them. Ultimately, what they are hoping for is Jesus is going to fight for them in their battles of life. I would say a lot of our fears and doubts, angers, and even frustrations about God and Jesus stem from that same root. And here is Jesus saying that that's exactly what I'm going to do. He's saying to the disciples, I'm going away, but yet I'm staying with you. I'm going away, yet I'm coming alongside of you. I'm going away, yet I am going to stay and fight for you. But I'm not going to do any of this in any of the ways that you are picturing. In fact, Christ says to us, I'm going to do this in a way that is better than you could have ever imagined. I'm going to do this through another. I'm going to do this through another advocate who will always be with you, who will always be standing beside you, who in every circumstance, in every battle, will be fighting alongside of you. One who will be always with you, who will always be with you in this way. Jesus says, I'm going away to make you a home in heaven. But the one I'm sending to you, he's going to make his home in you in each and every one of you. For he will not be bound by space or time as Jesus is in human flesh. Rather, he will be alongside every, every, every believer in any and all circumstances that they face. Jesus says in the Holy Spirit, I'm going to send an eternal presence, an eternal power, an eternal peace that is always going to be with you, always alongside of you, and always fighting for you for you. But again, not fighting in the way that you are picturing. Let me ask you, how are the disciples picturing that Jesus is going to fight for them at this moment in the upper room? And they're picturing how we fight. They're picturing a sword. They think Jesus is going to come and restore the the lowercase k kingdom, the worldly kingdom to them and to Israel. They're fighting for their seat in this kingdom they want Jesus to bring. In other words, they think and they hope that Jesus is going to come with a sword and make all of their problems. And the chief among them in their eyes, their problem was Rome. They think that Jesus is going to come with a sword and cut that problem to pieces. And even flash forward to Acts chapter 1, post Jesus' resurrection. In verse number 6, what are the disciples still concerned about there? They think that Jesus is still primarily about restoring the kingdom to just Israel. Even in that moment, and in that moment prior to this gift of the Holy Spirit coming alongside and doing all that Jesus promises the Holy Spirit is going to do, the disciples still think that Rome is their greatest problem. Now let me ask you, was Rome their biggest, greatest problem? Is Rome even a thing anymore? No, Rome was blown away with the wind. They were just another paper empire doomed to fail, and fail it did. Even when the disciples were looking at the resurrected Jesus in the eye, even putting their fingers into his pierced side and fearing, feeling his pulse that still ran through his body, even after he had gone to be with the Father, the disciples still could not see that their real and ultimate problem had been defeated. Their immediate circumstances had blinded them to fully seeing that Jesus had just fought for them and conquered for them their greatest enemy, an enemy far greater and more challenging than Rome. Brothers and sisters, we can be, and oftentimes are more like the disciples than we would care to admit. Oftentimes, we are blinded by our circumstances and blinded so we cannot see that standing before us in God is the God who conquered sin and death itself. And if he conquered sin and death itself, he certainly can conquer our version of Rome. Jesus says to the disciples, if you really loved me, if you really knew me, you would be happy, you would be pleased, you would be celebrating that I am leaving. The reason we should be happy that Christ is leaving is because of the one that he has sent to us, the one that he has given to us. The Holy Spirit, the one who comes alongside all believers in all circumstances, comes alongside all believers in all circumstances as an advocate. Do you remember what Jesus did there? That's 
the advocacy role that the Holy Spirit plays in our eyes. He points to the cross and reminds us, do you remember what Jesus did at the cross? Do you remember what your, Holy, your Heavenly Father gave at the cross? What they proved at the cross? They proved that Satan, sin, and death truly have no charge, truly have no hold on our God. So if we put our faith in our God, then truly Satan, Satan, and death have no hold on us. That's the ultimate role of advocacy, of pointing, of counsel that the Holy Spirit plays in our lives. And make no mistake, believer, it is an eternal advocacy, an eternal work that the Holy Spirit plays, much like the wind. But the frustrating thing about the Holy Spirit versus Jesus, God in the flesh that Jesus is, is the Holy Spirit, like the wind, the Holy Spirit is, is unknown, is unseen, and unaccepted by the world. Jesus continues by saying the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keep them, keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Now, what in the world is Jesus saying to us here? Think of an earlier illustration that we've already talked about, both at Bible study recently and our Sunday morning study of the Holy Spirit. An illustration that Jesus uses in John chapter 3 with our pal Nicodemus and comparing the work of the Holy Spirit to wind. We can taste the rain. We can see the sun. And that makes sense to us. But the wind, we, we never see the wind. We can't taste the wind. Even our feeling of the wind is really no feeling at all because in the most literal sense, it is gone with the wind. But you can see the wind's work. When you pull into the church's driveway, you can see that the maple tree that once stood there has been blown over by the wind. The same is true of the lives of believers and the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers. We can't see, we can't use any of our senses, we can't use any of our comprehensions to harness in any way what the Holy Spirit does or, or who he is. But you know what believers can do that the world cannot do. We can see the Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit is working in the world. I mean, there's no way to explain, except for the Holy Spirit's work, that it, these few scared men in Galilee, in hiding in this moment, how they became and began a powerful movement that has spread and spanned the globe and is still going to this day. I mean, think about it. There is just no way that the church happens without the work of God, without the work of the Holy Spirit. We believers, we those filled with the Holy Spirit, even in our own blindness and sin and death that, that still exists in our lives, we are able to see that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is the work of the Holy Spirit. But what Jesus says to us in these verses is the world cannot see that. The world refuses to see that. Right? The work of the Holy Spirit in the world's eyes is, is the work of chance. It's the work of luck. It's the work of fairy tales. It's the work of of myths. It's the work of some sort of cosmic lottery system. But we know that this world, we believers know this world is not left to chance or luck. We know that it is under complete harness and control of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, it is an eternal advocate for believers that reminds us that the Holy Spirit is at work in us and in the world around us. And so out of this, though, Judas pipes up, not, not that Judas, the other Judas, he pipes up and asks a question that might be on your mind this morning as well in reference to the world not being able to see the work of the Holy Spirit. He asks, why does God only show himself to son? And Jesus answers with this, be mindful and very, very uh, meticulously study Jesus' word. Jesus says and answers with, I will show myself to all people, but only anyone, only anyone, that's a pretty broad net that he cast there, only anyone who loves me will see me. But at the same time, only anyone who does not love me 
will not see me and thus will not obey me. What does that mean? Well, I can, for example, I can show you how great NASCAR is over and over and over again. I can point out, I can point to you, you can read how great NASCAR is. I can show you how great NASCAR is through highlights reels and race clips. Shoot, even a divine power can work in the minglings of your life to show you how great NASCAR is. But if you refuse to see how great NASCAR is, even in being shown how great NASCAR is, if your heart is so hard that you refuse to see how great 800 horsepower stock cars is, then, then you will not actually see how great NASCAR is. You will have been shown how great NASCAR is, but you will not actually see how great NASCAR is. It really is the same with our God. It doesn't matter how many times, how many varied ways an individual can be shown how great, how kind, how loving our God is towards them, how much kindness and forbearance God shows to them personally and intimately. The reality is some hearts, some eyes refuse to see it. But make no mistake in Judas's question, where Judas's question stems from, make no mistake that God was lifted up on the cross just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness so that all will be shown that God loves them. But just as with the Israelites in the wilderness, only some saw, only some looked to Jesus and saw Jesus for who he was and what he had done for them. All are shown God's love. Only some see God's love. And then, and so then only some experience the peace of God's love and the peace of the Holy Spirit. Jesus continues in verse 25 with this. He says, all this I have spoken whilst with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave you with, my peace I give you, for I do not give to you as the world gives, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Verses 25 and 26 are foundational verses for our understanding of Scripture, for our understanding of the Bible as what it is, as God breathed, for our understanding as the Bible as the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God, as for our understanding as the Bible as not just the book, but as the literal Word of God from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Now, we know Jesus said a lot of things to the disciples over his three years of doing life and ministry with them. Jesus is saying a lot of things to them in this upper room, more than our Gospels, as, as much as they contain, certainly more, much more than our Gospels can contain. He still has much more to say to them. He will still teach them more after his resurrection. And it's all more than mere man. It's all more than mere mortal can remember. But the great thing that these verses teach us is man doesn't have to remember it. We see they didn't have to just recall it and rely on their memory. One of the Holy Spirit's roles that he carried out was to remind and also add to the disciples, add to the apostles all that Jesus taught and had spoken to them. There's this absolute heresy in our day to reject, for example, Paul's letters because, quote, those are the words of Paul and not God. And the reason for that is our sin nature, because Paul says a lot of things that our world doesn't want to hear and obey, and so they like to point to those red letters, to the Gospels as God's Word, and the epistles, those letters in our Bible, as just Paul's Word. But uh, these are right here from, from the red letters, from Jesus' words himself, saying that, that those aren't Paul's words, that those aren't just man's words, but those are God's words. The apostles, of which Paul was one because he encountered the physical risen Christ on the Damascus road. Remember what an apostle is. An apostle is just someone who encountered the physical risen Christ, and Paul had a special place as an apostle. They did not write these things. Jude, James, John, Paul, they did not write these things on their own. They wrote these words guided and inspired by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of God himself. So in the Bible, there is no such thing as Paul's word. There is only God's word. And through that word and through the Holy Spirit comes God's peace. Only through that 
Holy Spirit comes God's peace. Jesus says, peace I leave you with. My peace I give you. For I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. What does this mean? Why is the peace of Jesus unmatched and unfound in our world? Well, to understand this, you have to understand that peace in Jesus' day and world was a popular greeting. Peace would be our version of good morning, right? In, in greeting someone with peace, you were wishing upon their lives. You were wishing upon their family. You were even longing upon their lives and their family for, for peace. But when Jesus says, I greet you with peace, I give to you my peace, that is not the peace of this world. It's a peace that is unfound in this world. He means three things to us in that. He says, one, the peace of God that I give to you, it's a peace that does not lack. Whole life. It's a whole life peace. It's a whole mind peace. It's a whole body peace. It's a whole soul peace. The peace of the world and the peace that the world wishes upon your lives is, is certainly not a whole peace. It's a peace that leaves you longing. It's a peace that leaves you wanting. Don't believe me? Look at the amount of anxiety that exists in our world. Look at the suicide rate that exists in our world. Look at the drug problems of our world. The various ways, the various places that our world has searched and continues to search for something to shove in the hole, to something to shove in the empty place that they have in their lives. Has it ever worked? Is it working? No. A world has not and will never be able to find peace in the world. But Jesus says, don't worry, my peace is not like this peace. One thing he says, it is guaranteed. Building off what I just said, there are so many places that our world sells as offering to us peace. Again, has it ever worked? Will it ever work? No. It always leaves us longing. It never lasts. Some of the world's remedies for peace, it may give us a momentary relief from stresses and the griefs of this world. But do you know what the problem is with a momentary relief from the stresses and griefs of this world? Is it just the moment, right? And our lives, they are made up not of one moment, but of many moments. Our lives, our souls are made up of, of countless moments. Taking a step back, a, a large step back, and looking at our lives on the scale of eternity, our lives are made up of literal, endless moments. But Jesus says, if you love me, I will, no questions asked, I will give you a helper, a helper who will be with you forever. A helper who is your advocate for your good forever. A helper who will give you and point you to peace, my peace, my whole, my everlasting, my non-lacking peace forever. There is no substance or salve of this world that can even offer that. So the question we close with is this, how do we receive this gift? How do we receive this peace of the Holy Spirit? Jesus says to us three things to this, on this in verses 28 through 31. Let's read what he has to say first. He says, you heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. We receive this gift first through the cross. We have the benefit of the Holy Spirit in hindsight that the disciples did not have in this moment. So we can better understand what Jesus means when he says, if you love me, you would be glad that I am going away, going to the Father, and then back to you. We can see and understand that Jesus means that he is going first to the cross, then to the Father, and then back to us before sending this gift of the Holy Spirit. So the question is, why does Jesus need to first go to the cross before the Holy Spirit can come? Because, remember, Jesus, the cross, inaugurates a new era. He inaugurates a new relationship with believers and the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon believers in unique circumstances and in unique ways. It would never dwell with them eternally, and it would not come to even all believers. 
But now, because of the cross, the Holy Spirit actually dwells. It tabernacles. It resides in all believers in all circumstances, in all places. And so what the cross is, it is the eraser. It is the bridge. It is the gateway. It is whatever metaphor that you want to use. It is the end of the separation. It is the closing of the gap between us and God that is sin. Now we no longer have to wear that bell around our waist when we approach God so that our dead bodies can be pulled out if we entered into God's presence in an unclean and a sinful state. The cross has forever and eternally made us clean. Now we don't have to enter into God's presence at all. God does not dwell in a man-made temple. He does not dwell in a wood ark. He does not dwell even in a smoke cloud above. God dwells everywhere, including in every believer. God enters into you. And that is only possible through the cross. And it only becomes a reality in our lives through belief. Jesus says in verse number 29, I have told you now why. I've told you all this now why before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. Again, going back to the distinction between being shown something and actually seeing something. The cross was shown to a lot of people. A lot of people went by Calvary's Hill on Good Friday and saw with their eyes, look, they were shown what was happening, right? The best example of this is in the two closest eyewitnesses to the cross and the criminals on each side of Jesus. Each were shown the cross in the same way, but only one saw the cross for what it was. The Son of God laying down his perfect life so that all who believe in the Son of God shall be with the Son of God. With the Son of God in paradise. Regardless of where and how their life here on earth has gone. We know that it was the thieves seeing and believing in the Son of God that guaranteed Jesus' gift of peace even upon his life which had clearly not gone well, which was clearly not filled with peace prior to this moment. Now that thief on the cross had little time on earth to actually live out his belief, which we know belief is always expressed. Love for Christ and love for anyone is always expressed in obedience. The cross or the thief on the cross had little time to actually express that this side of heaven. But for us to have a little more time between our seeing and believing and to our realizing the fullness of Christ's peace in paradise, Jesus says to us, simply do as I have done. Live your life in my love. What's the best way to live your life in, to God's love? It's through obedience to God and his word. Listen, the reality that we as Christians have to ask the Holy Spirit to help us wrap our minds around is that God is our good creator. That God created everything, including you and I. And how did God create everything, including you and I? He created a good He created it whole. He created it filled with peace. He created it not lacking anything. We marred that. We messed that up. And so now we live in a world that is not good. We live in a world that is not filled with peace. We live in a world that lacks greatly. We are not who and we are not what we were created to be. What were we created to be? We were created to be good. We were created to be whole. We were created to be peace-filled. We were created to not lack a thing. We've changed that. But God hasn't changed. He is still our good creator, and thanks be to God, he is our good restorer. He is our good sustainer. He is still good. And so as our good creator. He knows what is best for us. He created us, and he wants what is best for us. So we have to continually ask the Holy Spirit to help us see God, God's word, God's ways, God's call to obedience, not as a heavy burden that an oppressive dictator places around our necks to live out, but for what they are. That is what, for what is truly good for us, for what is truly best for us, for what will truly bring peace, whole life, whole body, whole soul peace. 
And so experiencing the love of our good God is, is best expressed, best expressed through our lives, through obedience. The Holy Spirit is God's gift to us. So how do we, re- how do we take this gift home with us? How do we live this out? I remind you of two things, two things that Jesus has reminded us of throughout his last night with us in the flesh before the cross. First, the Holy Spirit is preparing a home in you. Listen, coming to faith in Jesus Christ does not mean that you come to complete and total obedience, complete and total understanding of God and his ways. That will not come this side of paradise, this side of heaven. We still, we still continue to prove it every day of our lives. We still fall short of the glory of God. But that sin and falling short does not mean that the Holy Spirit does not fully dwell in you. It does not mean that you don't have full access to the Holy Spirit. It does not mean that God does not love you. It does not mean that you are not saved by his grace, that your faith is not real. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life the moment that you call out to him as Savior and Lord. But we are all fixer-uppers, right? Right? If Chip and Joanna Gaines would have a field day fixing up our lives, if, if, we were, if we were houses and they were the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit has a lot of work to do in our lives, but thanks be to God, he has unlimited, an unlimited budget to do it. He has unlimited resources to do it. He has unlimited time to do it. He never, 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 never comes up short in his work. So be confident of this. Be confident of the promise of God's word that he who has begun a good work in you, he will bring it to completion. The Holy Spirit is your eternal advocate. He is eternally coming alongside you and he is eternally pointing you to his complete peace. Peace that is without end. Never forget that while the Holy Spirit prepares that home in you, Jesus is also preparing a home for you. I would say these two truths are the summation of all that Jesus says to us on his final night before the cross. He says in this moment specifically, Philip, if, if you knew me, Philip, if you loved me, you would be happy that I'm going away. We can insert our names in Philip's place there. If we know him, if we love him, we are happy. We are overjoyed that, that Christ went away. That if he, when we know him, when we love him, we have the assurance of going forward, knowing and loving Jesus Christ as he has already known and loved us. And in, out of that assurance, we have the assurance of knowing that this world, this sinful and fallen world, this world that is plagued with diseases and cancers of many kind, that this world is not our home. But that Jesus is preparing our home. And knowing that that world will be unlike the first, will be, I should say, that will, it will be like the first home that he prepared for us. That it will be good. It will be perfect. It will be filled with peace and it will lack nothing. Mainly, it will lack, it will not lack the presence of our Savior. What is the gift of the Holy Spirit that we have and that we have to realize that we have? It's that the one who lived the perfect life loves you and now lives in you. Because of this, out of this love, because of this presence and power, his new life by grace and through faith is our new life. His new life, that power that raised him to new life, forever defeating sin, forever defeating death and the grave, is your new life. It's your power. It's God's gift to you. So I ask you once more, Christian, do you realize the gift that you have? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, I thank you for this powerful reminder of your word that the Holy Spirit illuminates in our lives, Lord. That you have loved us to such a love, to such an intensity, that we have this great, endless gift that is the peace, power, and presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That we have full access to that peace and power. That even in the midst of, of so many things that come at us, physical 
diseases and cancers, oppositions in this world for living our lives for Christ, hardships in the church, hardships in our families, Lord, that in the midst of all this, all the things that we lack in this world, that we as believers, we lack nothing in Christ. We lack nothing in the Holy Spirit. We have the access to the full and complete peace and power of God through that Holy Spirit that dwells within each and every one of us, Lord. And so my prayer for all those within the sound of my voice, all those that, that dive into your word and call your son as Savior, Lord, that we would be able to go forth with that reminder of the Holy Spirit, continually writing on our hearts, writing across the foreheads of our minds, that we have the eternal peace and power of the Holy Spirit available to us, that throughout whatever comes in this world, that, that the Holy Spirit is preparing a home in us, that that means that we will not be perfect, we will never completely live out the, this power that lives within us, Lord, but eternally that Holy Spirit is pointing us back on that narrow path that leads to light and life everlasting. So Lord, remind us of that power and that presence. Enable us through that reminder to live out the power of that and presence and continue to remind us, continue to set our eyes above on heaven these things. Take our eyes away from these things that are immediately in front of us. Take our eyes away from the roams of our world, the roams that stand in opposition of our church, and set our eyes on Christ, the one who has been lifted up on the cross, and in that lifting up, in his resurrection from the grave, he's given to us new and eternal life and the gift of the power, presence, and peace of the Holy Spirit. Help us, enable us to go forward in that peace, living out the new life and identity that you have fully given to us, Lord. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand and worship with us this morning?